Hello and welcome to episode five of Morg Five. Uh, this episode is going to deal with changes of foot in terms of regulation of EU content, uh, both at an EU level and in Ireland, and we'll discuss why in Ireland in a minute. I'm joined by Senator Alice Mary Higgins, an Irish parliamentarian. She's an independent senator, and she's been very kind to join us today to talk us through some of the um, legislation that's pending, as well as some of the recent legislation that's already passed at an EU and Irish level. Senator Higgins has spoken at the World Forum of Democracy on Big Data, has presented at the Conference of Western Attorney Generals, and is recognised as uh, one of the leading parliamentarians in question of data protection and, and data legislation and regulation in Ireland. Um, Senator Higgins, thank you very much for joining us. Delighted. Uh, I think we'll probably start somewhere, probably on uh, an attempt to be topical. There was a poll out today uh, in Ireland where people were asked, should the EU do more to regulate digital media platforms, including online sources of news, information sharing platforms on social media? And 71% of them said, yes, they wanted to see more regulation. Um, Ireland is already a sort of a hub for the technology industry uh, globally, uh, one of the major locations for the GDPR's regulatory system, the one-stop shop for many of the largest companies in the world and the technology sphere. But that's not the only thing that Ireland looks like it's going to be regulating on. We've got uh, an audiovisual directive coming down from the EU um, that will regulate YouTube, for example, as well as other Irish-based video uh, sites. And it is, as far as I know, the very first introduction of an EU-wide internet content regulation. Have you any thoughts on what has taken us to this point? Well, I think the appetite for regulation is actually coming from the public. So it's really important, I think, to understand it's not something simply from legislators, but it is that sense for the public wanting to kind of have a sense of ownership and accountability in online activity and in data protection. And I think it's been a really interesting model for when we come to online content, when we look at GDPR, because mm. in transposing that, what we had to do is to look to almost it's a learning for both states and for, I think, um, you know, online actors, because it's about uh, making sure that it's not about a balance of, you know, does the state own the data? Is it kind of a authoritarianism versus libertarianism? What's really clear is that it's actually around people's ownership of their information. And uh, it's been a learning curve for states. For me as a legislator, I need to make sure that the way that we handle data as a state, we do that in a responsible way. And that gives us then credibility when we, when we regulate the other uses of that data by other actors. So when we come to the AV directive, and we're looking now at a huge new set of provisions in relation to online content, it's going to be really important that we're bringing those same principles to bear. So just as a sense of where the AV directive uh, is coming from, or the audiovisual directive is coming from, it, it's rooted in some new concepts and some very old and strong concepts. One is um, uh, the principles it identifies are things like cultural diversity. And that comes from the exception culturale, which was something brought in in the 1990s in trade talks. And I've been honored to meet the person who negotiated that, um, which said, cultural activity and cultural participation cannot be simply commercial product, but they in fact uh, require protection in terms of their participation and expression. There's also uh, principles of accessibility for people with a disability in terms of the web. And there's also then combating hatred and looking to measures to combat hatred. But then on the other side, this is the next step in what the EU would call identifying, naming, uh, online media services providers and ensuring their rules-based development. So they've been springing up and now how do we ensure the next steps for those media service providers are rules-based, including what they call uh, qualitative regulation of commercial communications. And I think in particular, where there is commercial activity, it's recognized we need to have a higher standard of regulation. So mm. that's where maybe the AV directive is coming from. Um, and now we're looking to the question of transposing it in Ireland, um, which, you know, it's interesting from a number of levels. And I know that you've uh, expressed concerns yourself in terms of the scope of how it uh, will, will, will be. Yes. Transposed. I mean, one of the things that struck me there while you were talking is that 
these are things which we have seen companies attempting to impose norms around themselves. Um, and there was a big there was a big uh, discussion about whether it was proper for social media companies to act against uh, political actors, depending on what they had said, how they should draw the lines in relation to uh, allowing people to use their platforms where the free speech elements were. But it seems like the EU's point of view is less to allow the companies to make those decisions internally and rather to impose a set of externally created principles. Does that seem reasonable as a, as a position? I think that it's a combination. So when you look to the detail of the AV directive, well, they, they have what they establish as codes of conduct and the idea that codes of conduct would be created. And that's in the Irish online regulation as well, um, mm. is around that idea of codes for different actors in different areas. But there is, I think, uh, both the pressure for greater self-regulation, but what, what's been asked is that certain principles must be considered in that self-regulation. And I think that's mm. really important because it isn't uh, simply for um, online actors to decide what the, are the principles that matter to them, they do need to reflect and engage with the fact that they are situated in the real world, in real legislative and regulatory contexts, and that they're intersecting with other legislation. So, for example, uh, legislation um, around that principle of participation, uh, around those principles I mentioned of cultural diversity. Those are mm. contexts in which any self-regulation will happen. And yes, there are absolutely also requirements for firmer regulatory me measures in terms of key thresholds. You were mentioning that we're moving to transpose this already existing European directive. And of course, European law, when it's a directive, it needs to be transposed by member states into their own local laws. And um, I have a kind of a helpful infographic that shows Ireland's plan or the, the current plan for the transposition of this information into Irish law, which will, of course, apply to uh, a very large number of technology companies, in effect, becoming the de facto norms. So you'll see there that reading from left to right on that, it's a very extensive um, plan. It seems to me that we seem to be ambitious in our, in our aims at regulating quite a breadth of uh, internet content. Does, does anything in that, uh, in that sequence give you pause or do you think that this is something the Irish state is ready and ready and able to, to take on? Okay, so I might come back to the, the scope in a section, uh, but one thing to mention, you mentioned transposition. Each country, when it takes these European directives into place, does have a lot of choices. So for example, on GDPR, a really important choice in Ireland, one I would have pushed hard for along with others, was that the state would itself be liable to fines. You know, we have the opportunity to waive fines so that it, the state itself would be accountable under the same regulations. And that, again, gave, I think, that important balancing uh, and understanding of the empowerment principle that's needed in GDPR that people did is their own. Similarly, in this, there are going to be a lot of choices in the transposition. So just to highlight a few of the areas that I'm, I will be watching for, uh, we're currently in the pre-legislative scrutiny stage of this legislation where it's been examined by our Attorney General and it's also been examined by committees. So, but just to give a sense, um, a key concern is the resourcing because mm -hmm. we know that the Data Protection Commissioner in Ireland is literally getting tens of thousands uh, of complaints, of concerns because of Ireland's situation in relation to so many key data actors. And mm -hmm. it was very worrying, I think, when we've heard they plan to resource this to the same level as the Data Protection Commissioner, which is extremely under-resourced. Well, just for our viewers' uh, benefit, I can tell you that the Irish Greyhound Board, which is a, a body looking after racing at Greyhound tracks, receives more state funding than the Data Protection Commission yeah. from the Irish government. So it, there's a history of underfunding the, uh, the so, regulation, regulatory aspect. It, there. Exactly. And there is that resourcing. And the other question is that question of individual versus uh, collective. It is these AV directives are not designed to deal with individual complaints or individual disputes. They are really designed to deal with systemic issues. Um, and there's actually quite a pushback because a lot of civil society would like to see individual complaints being addressed. And the question of who can bring a complaint um, is going to be a key issue when we're transposing this. It's also though really important because if we're looking and in some parts of the bill as proposed, um, an investigation may be launched not on the basis of a complaint, but on 
the what they are calling the the online safety commission's own volition they can decide to launch an investigation that question of proportionality and necessity is going to be really key because when you're looking to patterns and not to individual complaints it's going to be really important that we don't have uh, what would be regarded as a a kind of a, a very broad sweep we don't have people kind of seeking out and, and that's important because that's another eu commerce principle as well mm. is that you cannot have basically constant monitoring uh, and that's and the, that's going to be really the online important safety in- commissioner the online safety commissioner just for the aid of everybody that's the mooted regulator for this this these content i uh, uh forms is that right uh, it is it's the online safety commission and again two things i'm concerned about there one is authorized officers have very very broad powers under this in terms of what i would say is uh potentially too wide in terms of the materials which they can uh require access to or indeed possession of and so forth so i think it's going to be one that's going to have to be really really carefully looked to um you know when is war- when are warrants for example appropriate that's something that's going to have to be examined the other issue in terms of these codes so the online safety commissioner as you mentioned will be setting out codes for a whole range of different media uh, media providers and media is what they call a media services. Mm-hmm. And they will be different in respect of each area. So something maybe to give reassurance to you, Simon, is there will be differences between the different areas, but there are certain areas, um, cloud services, cloud storage services, and um, interpersonal communication networks, mm-hmm. which will still have codes and will still be regulated under this but it's required that they can only be regulated in relation to criminal offenses or information that may be related to criminal offenses so in one way that narrows it but the other issue is we have a lot of different related legislation that's happening uh, in respect of different kinds so for example we have hate speech legislation we have online harmful communications legislation and I know you, you know that's a really key area of interest, but maybe just one last thing I would say. My, one of my concerns across Ireland's transposition at the moment is that the really exciting positive part, I think, of the AV directive, those parts around participation, those parts around uh, there's not maybe enough, they are left very vague in the bill. So mm. it is that idea, and when we come to hate speech and hate speech legislation and hate speech, it's important to address hate speech. I think... For me, that that idea of the exception cultural, that Mm -hmm. principle of having diversity and shared spaces and people's participation in communication, that same principle is exactly why uh, taking action against harmful communications or hate speech are important, because they stop people from participating in shared online spaces. And it is, to my mind, almost, it's not just around the individual's rights or protections, but it's around the collective good, which is wider participation. So I feel the protective measures are there to an extent in this bill, but those participation measures should indeed be stronger. And I, I know that. that <laughs> well, I mean, it seems to me that this is very much a difference between the norms of the technology industry, which has grown up in a US view of free speech and the EU view of content, uh, which is that in order to have a diversity of views, you would actually limit certain forms of speech in order to increase the participation of others. So that seems to me to be a new way of regulating content that perhaps the technology companies will will have to think about as they uh, as to how they'll implement it and and get to grips with how the regulator would see those things. It seems to me generally though that more regulation is on the way at an EU level. Um, regulation tends to be a ratchet. No one ever takes it away. There's only a, another layer to be put on top. And the EU Parliament are already demanding more action. Do you think that this is going to be the last time that we see an element of the technology industry uh, come under scrutiny or look uh, uh, to receive additional regulatory um, scrutiny from the EU? Well, no, I, I think that there's so much already happening. Like you mentioned, we have new legislation just since last year around harmful communications that's looking at image-based sexual violence. That is an offence now in Ireland. We have the Web Accessibility Directive, which is really placing demands in terms of the form of communication. But there's a lot more that will happen. But I think what's going to be really important, and maybe it's a a new area that is going to require more thought, 
is that our regulations in this area, in terms of online activity, in terms of data, is going to be intersecting with our other legislation. So, for example, I mentioned uh, that there's going to be powers in terms of interpersonal communication networks and cloud storage in relation to criminal offences. As new criminal offences get, get created in all kinds of other areas, that will become relevant to how this act will apply. So, mm. for example, um, the question of the definitions under the, the new hate crime legislation, which is also going to be moving through our Oireachtas, really interesting in terms of the hate crime legislation, is the offence applies whether or not the person committing it is physically in the jurisdiction if the information uh, if the information is being processed and stored in, 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 in an information uh, provider in that jurisdiction. So that's something right. really relevant when you think of, uh, again, and actually vice versa. So it's, it works both ways, whereby if the person is physically present, even if the information, the, the act is taking mm. place elsewhere. So I think we're going to see that kind of intersection whereby other areas of, of regulation, of, of, of accountability are going to be intersecting with uh, it's basically come under the gaze now and it will be a matter of an ongoing piece of, of development. And it seems uh, to me that this is a, this is this is part of the GDPR, an extension of GDPR's extraterritorial scope, that we're seeing that kind of a model being applied to other forms of of um, of regulation. I want to thank I, you very much for talking to us today. <laughs> and I know you want to say more, but what I was going to say is that, in fact, you're going to have an opportunity to say more, for which we're very grateful, because you were good enough to agree to give us a keynote talk at the next MOG conference. And uh, if people want to hear that, they, would you want to tell us what the, the title of your talk is? I'll be speaking about policy, power and place, and I will be looking at how digital activity, how online actors are going to be situated and are situated both in real planetary boundaries and in real regulatory and legislative environments uh, who are increasingly working together. And so it is going to be part uh, of the shaping of the next chapter, the next direction in terms of online services, in terms of our digital landscape. It's going to be in that very real landscape. And principles like policy principles, like digital empowerment, like those questions of cultural diversity are going to have to be part of how we think about both the online actors and how they can think about what they do, but also what regulators think about. And I'll be maybe giving a couple of examples of the legislation we're hearing, but also the new legislation, which is coming down the way in areas like algorithms. And an example of how we as legislators in Europe are talking to each other and working together around algorithmic uh, regulation. And uh, I'm hoping it'll be very interesting. Well, I, I, I'm confident it will be. Thank you very much indeed, Senator. Hayes.